uh, for the session, uh, Mr. Nadrajan Rangasamy. I take immense pleasure uh, to introduce him to you. Uh, he has total <clears throat> total of 35 years of experience uh, uh, in industry, and he has saved, served uh, Syndicate Bank in various capacities for 16 years. And uh, in 1999, when he left the bank, he was uh, serving as Asset Liability Management Department. Uh, he, he also has 14 years of experience in clearing corporation uh, of India Limited and uh, there he has introduced uh, uh, he has developed a CBLO a money market instrument right from conceptual design uh, trading risk management clearing and settlement of transactions in CBLO uh, the, the particular instrument has been the average uh, volume of that particular instrument was 1.5 lakh crore uh, <clears> that was a great uh, uh, achievement by him uh, participants. Uh, he, has, he has also established uh, OTC derivative department in CCIL, uh, creation of trade repositories of interest rate, currency and uh, deriv uh, credit derivatives. He has also, adding to its credit, he has also five years uh, experience with NSE Clearing Limited and uh, he is the one who uh, did the introduction of Tripathi repo in uh, corporate debt instruments. Uh, that was a, uh, I guess uh, this session is going to be very enriching for us because we have one eminent person from the field uh, to be with us to, uh, to explain us on the instruments. Thank you and uh, welcome you, sir. Over to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, friends. Uh, so for the next 90 minutes, I will be taking you through uh, uh, my presentation on this uh, interest rate derivatives introduction to interest rate derivatives and uh, mainly I'll be concentrating today on uh, the OTC interest rate uh, derivatives like uh, interest rate swaps and forward rate agreements. So in I think unlike uh, the physical classroom uh, sessions. So since this is a virtual uh, ses uh, session now, uh, it will be very difficult to keep it very interactive. But anyway, we'll try to make it uh, more interactive at any point of time. You can stop me if you want any clarifications. I'll be willing to respond to your queries. So let us move to the uh, uh, topic on interest rate derivatives. Uh, before actually we go to this interest rate derivatives, we'll have to slightly go back to the basics of uh, the interest rate. Uh, what is interest rate? So interest rate uh, is the fee that a lender charges for the amount lent and is expressed as a percentage of the principal typically noted on an annual basis. It is an annualized. Uh, uh, percentage which is charged on the principal amount by the lender on the to the borrower so in this uh, world of money the funds are borrowed and lent funds are borrowed at a cost and funds are lent at a uh, fee and uh, it the interest rate depends on the prevailing uh, uh, the market rates uh, before 1996 uh, the interest rates in the market were totally regulated by Reserve Bank of India for any deposits to be quoted to the uh, customers for various tenors and also for the loans uh, and advances to various sectors in the economy. Uh, RBI used to fix the rates. This is what the rate you should uh, charge your uh, uh, borrowers and this is uh, this is the rate uh, no, you have to pay to your depositors. So the interest rates were totally under regulated regime, but subsequently various committees recommendations uh, and introduction of this uh, financial uh, sector reforms. Uh, from 1996 onwards, slowly actually this uh, interest rates were uh, deregulated. Now the interest rates are totally regulated, uh, deregulated and interest rates are determined by the market forces depending on the uh, demand and supply. Uh, and another thing, uh, what sort of interest, no, what sort of interest rate actually has to be charged to the borrower? It all depends on the risk uh, category of the borrowers. If uh, the, corp, uh, the cat borrowers category is the uh, corporates, uh, uh, the interest rate varies actually depending on their ratings. Like you no know, triple A rated entity would enjoy a better rate than uh, double A rated entity or double a, a single A rated entity. Uh, for retail individuals, anyway, the civil started actually scoring uh, the credit scoring for retail uh, in uh, individuals. So any score of uh, civil above 700 is considered to be a, a good score, and uh, those customers would enjoy a preferential uh, treatment in respect of the interest rates to be charged on them. So it all depends actually if you are a low risk category, then you will uh, uh, enjoy a better rate. If you are a high risk category, you will uh, uh, get a higher rate of interest you have to pay for your borrowings. And uh, 
another thing uh, what are the various factors when i say market forces to determine then what are the various factors that can influence the interest rates in the market uh, primarily i have taken three main factors so one is inflation then uh, the second is money supply and third is uh, the demand for the credit so when you go to any bank and or any uh, investment if you want to make the rates that are offered to you they are considered to be nominal rate of interest so nominal rate of interest has a component uh, called inflation so whatever uh, the inflation rate that is adjusted net of that uh, inflation rate is the real rate of interest uh, which you will get so currently if you look at uh, the interest rate offered by the banks and all know for a, a five year deposit or something like that no you are you'll get around the 6 6 and of uh, uh, percent whereas the inflation currently if you look at it's around the 7 of or 7.60 percent so ideally you are uh, getting a negative uh, rate of interest on your deposits so this is uh, uh, that means actually you will be losing your principal amount you will be using your principal amount uh, uh, for your spends so if inflation is uh, reduced then interest also will be reduced if interest is, inflation is uh, uh, going to increase again the interest rate is going to increase so there is a rba reviews every uh, bi monthly listing on all the credit policy or monetary policy and accordingly they uh, review the prevalent situation on the macro factors economic factors and accordingly they look at uh, uh, the reviewing of uh, the policy rates like you no know, the repo and reverse repo rates uh, in the last policy also the rates uh, remain unchanged the currently the repo rate is around 4% that is uh, the repo in the sense actually how much uh, uh, the banks can uh, can borrow from the rbi at what rate that is 4% and if banks want to park funds actually with rbi rbi offers around 3.35% so that is the kind of interest rate actually prevailing in the market now uh then second uh, factor is the money supply the money supply is uh, purely i'm just talking from the uh, liquidity available in the banking system uh if you look at currently the banking system because there is no uh, demand actually for the credit uh, uh, from the industry the, from the private sectors uh almost 600 trillion rupees actually is uh, uh, held with the banks as, as a surplus so every day if you look at uh, this 600 of uh, trillion rupees actually is parked with the money market instruments and also parked with the uh, reserve bank of india under laf so if excess money supply is there then that brings down the interest rate if uh, uh, deficit uh, money or uh, deficit liquidity available in the system then uh, the interest rate is going to increase so mostly the liquidity in the system uh, the money supply those actually impact at the shorter uh, end of the yield curve uh, Whereas primarily, if you look at in India, the yield curve is always uh, upward sloping. So occasionally it comes actually a flat uh, yield curve. Uh, mostly it is upward sloping. That means actually a shorter uh, tenure will have a lesser rate of interest and uh, uh, medium term slightly higher. And then longer term will have a slightly higher rate of interest. Mostly the flattening of yield curve happens uh, in the longer rate of the yield curve. And the third uh, factor which I consider is the demand for the credit. If uh, more demand is there for credit, then interest rate uh, goes up. If uh, less demand is there for the credit, the interest rate uh, will be less in the market. So these are the primarily three factors actually increase in the interest rate in the market. Now, what is the interest rate risk actually? The interest rate risk actually, how, how, how is going to impact uh, uh, me actually, you know, as an investor or as an entity, uh, how it is going to impact you know, any interest rate fluctuation, how it is going to impact me as a uh, investment holder or uh, a lender. So when I say interest rate is, it is the probability of decline in the value of uh, market value of my assets or liabilities depending on the uh, fluctuation in the interest rates. You know the relationship between the interest rate and uh, the value of your assets or liabilities. So it is uh, just like inverse relationship between the interest rate and uh, uh, the market value of your assets and liabilities. If interest rate goes up, your value of your asset comes down. If uh, interest rate goes down, then your value of your asset uh, goes up. So this is the kind of relationship prevailing between the interest rate and uh, the value of your assets and liabilities. So be it the deposits or be the loans and loans and bonds or the borrowings or any investment portfolio or all assets and liabilities of uh, an entity, they are all subject to interest rates. So there are interest rates when I say, uh, there are two things. So one is actually, you know, uh, if I have some assets or liabilities which are going to uh, occur today, I mean, uh, there is some inflow of cash. If I want to actually make an investment, if I am able to invest at a higher rate of interest, then it will be good. If I make an investment at currently whatever the prevailing interest rate and subsequently if interest rate goes up, 
then i will be losing that opportunity of uh, making investment at a higher rate of interest because i have invested today at a lower rate of interest similarly actually when a lender uh, when a borrower takes a loan which is from the borrower say at a peak say higher rate of interest and subsequently when the interest comes down so he will be losing an opportunity of uh, uh, borrowing at a lesser cost so that is the kind of you know, one kind of interest rate risk actually these uh, depositors and borrowers uh, will have in their portfolio and uh, second thing actually whatever the uh, investments not typically if you look at the bond portfolio uh, bond carries actually a bond is issued for a certain uh, maturity period uh, with a certain coupon rate and those coupons normally paid uh, semi annually uh, during the life of uh, the during the maturity of the bond so that means every 6 months or uh, no, every 6 months you receive coupons uh, from your investments and uh, you will be able to reinvest those coupons at uh, the rates prevailing at that point of time if the interest rate goes up then you will be able to invest at a higher rate of interest or if interest goes down you will be able to less inter, you know, invest only at a lower rate of interest so this is uh, we call it as a you know reinvestment or uh, repricing risk so these are all uh, the kind of you know, interest rate is actually which uh, an individual or any entity is exposed to uh, on their portfolio then if you look at actually typically uh, i'm just putting on uh, the interest rate is in a matrix format so that on one side actually see an entity has uh, a typical we will take a, a financial firms like banks and all so they are assets they have liabilities uh, in their balance sheet when i say assets their loans and advances and uh, the investments actually are uh, categorized under the assets whereas on the liability side if you look at the borrowings and uh, their deposits you no know, which they are taken from the investors so they are shown in the liability side and these assets and the liabilities uh, can be linked to a fixed rate or a floating rate when i say fixed rate actually the rate is fixed at the time of the contract for the entire uh, period of the contract and uh, the interest rate will not change depending on the market uh, uh, rates whereas on the floating side if you look at if your investment if your uh, investment or if your uh, borrowings are linked to a uh, floating rate of interest so which are reference to a particular benchmark Uh, maybe actually it can be a mybor as the benchmark or it can be linked to a 364 day t bill uh, benchmark or 91 day t bill benchmark then at the every time actually when the coupon payments are done the next two coupon or next uh, the uh, the interest rate will be reset uh, for the next uh, uh, period of interest payment so whatever the rate prevailing at the same maybe actually uh, for the first six months the rate of interest is known now at the end of 6 month the period for the next 6 months will be fixed depending on the issue of uh, depending on the cost at which the 91 day t bill or 180 day t bill or 1364 day t bill are issued in the market so the interest rates are not known actually in advance for those periods so floating rate interest the rate rate for the current period is known for the future period uh, the interest rate is unknown so that is a kind of risk actually the floating rate interest rate uh, carries so a bank entity suppose actually uh, they have receiving their assets are uh, uh, issued at a fixed rate of interest and uh, their liabilities are also uh, created at a fixed rate of interest then both are uh, fixed both the interest rates are fixed for the entire period so you will not have any risk on the other hand on the contrary if the bank has to receive the fixed rate of interest on their uh, uh, loans and advances or the investment portfolio whereas on the other side the liability side if they created uh, more floating rate of interest then if interest rate goes up then the bank will be in a position actually no will be at a loss because they will be receiving less actually from the fixed rate of interest whereas on the other side because of the floating rate changes the because the because of the higher rate of interest they are at a higher rate of uh, uh, higher rate actually for their uh, liabilities similarly if they have to receive a uh, floating rate of interest for their assets and they have to pay fixed interest for their liabilities on the liability side the interest rate is fixed whereas on the asset side the interest rate is floating it is not known so you will have a, a rate of interest interest rate risk if interest rate goes on because your assets are going to be repriced at a lower rate of interest on the contrary if you have a floating rate uh, assets and also the floating rate liabilities both on the both are linked to a floating rate uh, both are linked to floating rates if they are linked to or their reference to same benchmark then you will not have any risk interest rate risk because you will be receiving on one side the floating rate uh, linked to cash flows on the other side you will be paying the floating rate uh, linked to cash flows to the your depositors so you will not have any risk 
because the benchmark is same. If your assets are linked to a benchmark and your liabilities are referenced to another benchmark, then you will you, the, your assets you will be exposed to the basis risk because the the floating rates benchmark two different benchmarks may not move together. They move differently. Actually, you know, may move slightly higher or lower than the other benchmark. So you will be exposed to a set of uh, basis risk actually when your uh, uh, assets and liabilities are referenced to two different uh, benchmarks. Now this is uh, just a graphical uh, presentation of the 10-year benchmark rate, how it has moved actually from uh, the year 2015-16 to uh, till now. 2015-16, uh, if you look at actually this, uh, it was almost around 8%. Then it came down to around six six quarter <coughs> towards uh, the close of 2017. And subsequently, it again shot up to around a more than 8% in the year 2018-19. Then now it is hovering around 6%, the 10-year benchmark. Assume actually somebody has created, uh, somebody has invested uh, at this lower rate of interest in 2016-17, uh, and you would have uh, lost the opportunity of actually making investment uh, when the interest rate moved up to 8%. Similarly, the liability, no, similarly, the borrowers who have borrowed actually at a higher rate of interest uh, in the 2018-19, and now the interest rate has come down, so they have lost the opportunity of actually uh, making their borrowings at a lower rate of interest. So you can see how volatile actually the interest rate movement has happened over a period of time since 2015-16. <clears throat> So now we know actually what sort of interest rate we are exposed to and now what are the various tools actually uh, uh, we can make use of actually to reduce or to mitigate our interest rate risk. That is where actually this interest rate derivatives uh, instruments uh, come handy. Uh, the interest rate derivative, various derivative instruments are available in the market. One is uh, the interest rate swap, the other one is the forward rate agreement, then interest rate options. And you look at uh, uh, then interest rate futures, then again interest rate options and the exchanges. If you look at these interest rate derivatives, they are traded on uh, uh, both the markets, that is actually OTC market as well as on the exchanges. So predominantly the OTC market, the interest rates are forward rate agreements are, uh, and the interest rate options are there. On the exchanges, interest rate futures and interest rate options. Uh, among all these uh, three instruments uh, in the OTC market, only interest rate swap market is very active. The forward rate agreement and interest rate options are not at all active. Uh, similarly, if you look at on the exchange side, the interest rate features market is slightly active, uh, not like OTC market. Uh, whereas interest rate option again is uh, defined actually on the exchange side. Interest rate swap in this OTC derivatives market was introduced in the year 1999 by RBI uh, after this uh, deregulation of uh, interest rates, no uh, deregulation of interest rates since 1996. So in order to uh, enable actually the banks to uh, manage their interest rate risk, uh, RBA came out with their guidelines on interest rate swaps and power rate agreements in the year 1999. And uh, subsequently, the interest rate swap market has uh, picked up uh, uh, quite well in the market. Uh, wherein actually this, in the, wherein uh, uh, RBA has permitted the banks and the primary dealers to act as uh, market makers. That means they can offer two-way quotes in the market uh, to their customers. Whereas all other entities uh, uh, should uh, make use of uh, these instruments, interest rate derivatives instruments only for hedging purposes. So that means they should have uh, underlying uh, to manage this into, to enter into uh, the interest rate derivative contracts. So these are all the various instruments that are available on the OTC market as well as on the exchanges to manage the interest rate rates. So we'll uh, just see uh, the OTC interest rate derivatives in India. So what is actually interest rate uh, derivatives? Uh, uh, the definition, uh, if you look at actually the interest rate derivatives are instruments whose value is uh, uh, based on or derived from the underlying interest rates. So now what are the various underlying interests uh, uh, that support actually this OTC interest rate derivative uh, instruments? The OTC derivative interest rate derivatives, if you look at, they have uh, uh, the interest rate swap instruments. The interest rate swap instruments, the underlying is the MIBOR rate, that is Mumbai Interbank uh, offer rate. And these uh, MIBOR rates are available for uh, uh, four tenors, that is overnight, 14 days, one month, and three months. 
the overnight market is uh, overnight uh, benchmark uh, market is very active and uh, 14 day one month and three month uh, we are not seeing any uh, uh, interest in the uh, market the overnight is slightly uh, is, is, uh, is uh, highlighted in bold because this overnight rate is a traded rate the delta rate actually on the uh, in the interbank market whereas the benchmark rates for 14 days one month and three months they are all pulled rates you know the globally as this issue of uh, libor benchmark was going on and uh, since libor was uh, uh, a pulled benchmark uh, there was uh, the high probability of actually manipulation that can happen in the market because of that is the stigma attached to the poll rates but in india we have adopted actually this uh, uh, my bar rate as a uh, trader rate for the overnight since the introduction of this uh, interbank market that is a call market uh, platform a typical uh, anonymous uh, typical electronic platform was introduced i think in the year 2005 2006 uh, for the bank entities and the primary dealers since then actually all the transactions in the interbank market uh, uh, happen on this uh, uh, nds india they call it nds call platform so rates are directly available on the platform so that is why we have resorted to this uh, uh, del rate actually to be the benchmark rate for the overnight uh, uh my bar whereas in other uh, 14 day uh one month and three month since the transactions uh, are not happening for this uh, 14 day one month and three month interbank market they continue to remain as the poll rates and another benchmark uh, which are uh, which is used actually in the interest rate swap market is the my for the my for is a very unique rate actually that is uh, uh, that is available only in india wherein actually this uh, rupee rates are derived from the foreign currency rates we'll see actually how these uh, rupee rates are derived from the foreign currency rates in our uh, subsequent slides when i see this uh, my for benchmark this my for benchmark is available for <coughs> overnight one month two month three month six month and 12 months so these are all again the poll rates uh, 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 available in the uh, market and uh, the rates are published by uh, financial benchmarks india private limited uh, that is a wing of uh, fimda FIMDA is again a self-regulatory body in the market that is a fixed income money markets derivatives association so that normally sets the principles and the guidelines that to the money market to the market so now among all this uh, uh, my bar benchmark and uh, uh, my for benchmark my bar benchmark only overnight is active in the my for benchmark uh, we have uh, slightly hacked, you know, improved activity uh, that has been witnessed in the recent days Whereas the forward rate agreement and interest rate options are not active in the what is interest rate derivatives market. So let us see actually this what is interest rate swap. So interest rate swap is an agreement between two counterparties to exchange uh, the interest cash flows, a series of interest cash flows which are to be <coughs> exchanged at a periodical intervals during the life of uh, the interest rate swap contract. So in this contract, actually one party agrees to pay the fixed rate of interest. The other counterparty agrees to pay the floating rate of interest. Floating rate of interest again, which is reference to the MIBAR benchmark in India. Uh, it is called a fixed floating uh, interest rate swap. There are other kinds of swaps available in the market, like you know, the floating to floating uh, interest rate swap also. That means actually uh, the counter one counterparty agrees to pay uh, interest on a particular uh, uh, benchmark whereas other counterparty agrees to pay the cash flows based on another benchmarks so here if the benchmarks move together then there is no basis risk if benchmarks are different then there could be a basis actually for the counterparties so most of the transactions uh, in our market happen based on this uh, fixed floating rate of uh, interest rate swaps so the fixed rate of interest in a way is uh, based on the current uh, prevailing rate in the market whereas the floating rate uh, is based on the my benchmark that is uh, overnight benchmark fixed on the nds call platform so here the terminology is like you know the buyer of the swap and seller of the swap the buyer of the swap actually face uh, fixed rate of interest whereas the uh, he receives a floating rate of interest on the other hand uh, uh, the seller of the swap actually receives uh, a fixed rate of interest he pays the floating rate of interest so these are the terminologies no buyer of the swap means he pays the fixed rate whereas the seller of the swap he pays the floating rate these are the terminologies used in uh, the market when the interest rate swap contract is entered uh, at the inception of the interest rate swap contract the present value of uh, the future cash flow discounted future cash flows uh, received from both the fixed legs and the floating legs should uh, be equal there should not be any arbitrage opportunity 
at the time of uh, the creating the contract then subsequently depending on the interest rate uh, movement the floating rate uh, may differ and because of it, such as the cash flows or uh, may also be different and the value of uh, uh, the swap need not be zero at that point of time so the, when i say standardization of irs contracts <clears throat> So 2013, uh, FIMDA has standardized uh, the IRS uh, derivative contracts. Before that, uh, there was no standardization in the market. Market could deal with any kind of uh, notional principal amount for any kind of tenor, uh, for any kind of uh, benchmark. This thing. There was no standardization actually as far as the terms of the contract is concerned. Then 2013, uh, 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 maybe based on the recommendations of the G20 uh, Pittsburgh Summit, uh, subsequent to this 2008 subprime crisis so there were three four recommendations were made uh, among those four recommendations uh, one was actually as far as possible standardization of the OTC derivative contracts and second recommendation was actually all this uh, standardized OTC derivative contracts should be traded on electronic platforms so these are the two main recommendations in respect of this uh, OTC derivative contracts there are two more recommendations uh, in the G20 uh, summit uh, all these standardized what is a derivative contract should mandately be settled through a yes, central counterparty that is the clearing corporations uh, to be established and they should act as a central counterparty and they should uh, uh, offer guaranteed settle, a guarantee mechanism to uh, the trades or contracts happening in the uh, derivatives market and whatever actually this uh, derivative contracts which are not settled through uh, the central counterparty they should they are they continue they will continue to remain bilateral uh, contracts but they should be margined uh, uh, at a higher uh, uh, margin percentages so these are some of the recommendations so, so based on the recommendations actually this uh, 2013 fimda standardized all those irs contracts so they fixed actually this minimum notional principal amount uh, is should be rupees 5 crores and the multiples of 5 crores thereafter and uh, tenor it should be a rolling uh, tenor like no one month two month three month six month nine month twelve months and two three four five seven and ten years so when i say rolling at any point of time or any day the fixed maturity contract should be available to the market the fixed maturity for all the standards tenors should be available to the market for trading then the settlement calculations how the settlement has to happen you no know, should be done for the cash flows uh, in the irs contracts so there also it is standardized the contracts which are having a maturity of one year up to one year the cash flows have to be exchanged on a bullet basis that is at maturity whereas in respect of all other contracts that are uh, having a maturity beyond one year the exchange of cash flow has to be done on a semi-annual basis and the trading hours anyway it is fixed between uh, 9 a.m and 5 p.m monday to friday so these are all some of the standardized uh, uh, conventions the FIMDA has introduced in their 2013. And in addition to that, uh, there are other terminologies uh, in the IRS contract. So we have this uh, trade date. Trade date is actually the date on which uh, uh, the contract is executed. Then we have another terminology called effective date. The effective date is actually uh, for the uh, IRS contracts. It is on a T plus one basis. My bar based IRS contract is on a T plus one basis. So the that means actually this uh, my bar rates are fixed normally at around 10 o'clock in the morning my bar rates are published the morning every day morning by fbil at around 10 o'clock so but market functions actually from uh, uh, nine o'clock to till five o'clock in the evening so when the the trade happens after 10 o'clock the rate the rate of my bar is already known so when the rate is already known there is no question of actually taking any hedging uh, uh, transaction based on that uh, uh, known rate so any hedging transaction or using of any derivative instrument should be for the unknown interest rates. So that is actually in this uh, uh, my bar based interest rate, uh, the effective date is T plus one business day. So that means today is the trade date and tomorrow is the uh, effective date for starting, uh, for approving of the cash flows. And we have this uh, business day convention. Uh, the business day convention is uh, uh, when uh, the cash flow happens to be on a holiday or when the maturity of the contract happens to be on a holiday or when the effective date of the contract happens to be a holiday then the market follows the next business day will be the effective date for all these uh, holidays so that means if a cash flow happens to be uh, on a holiday then the cash flow will get exchanged on the next subsequent uh, business day so this is called uh, uh, modified following business day convention in the market 
and the day count convention uh, for the IRS contracts is uh, is a money market day count convention that is actual by 365 days. Uh, we have two different conventions in our market day count conventions. Uh, for the government secure trading in the government securities, uh, we have a 30 by 360 convention. Whereas in all other money market instruments, uh, we have uh, actual by 365 days. So that means actually for a government security transaction, the interest accruals will happen considering 30 days in a month and 360 days in a year. So this is the convention being followed uh, right from introduction of this uh, uh, trading in government securities market. So these are all the uh, different uh, day, con uh, day count conventions uh, prevailing in the market. Well, let us uh, take a typical example of uh, an interest rate swap contract. Uh, uh, say here the counterparty A and counterparty B, uh, uh, they have done, uh, they have entered into an inter uh, interest rate swap contract for a notional value of uh, 100 crores uh, for a one month tenor. And wherein the counterparty A agrees to pay floating rate uh, uh, linked to MIBOR overnight to the counterparty B, whereas the counterparty B agrees to pay fixed rate of interest, that is 3.65% to, to counterparty A for one month uh, uh, swap contract. So this is the typical structure of the uh, uh, swap contract. So once the contract is entered, then since actually this uh, uh, maturity of this particular contract is less than a year, the exchange of cash flow will happen uh, on the maturity of the contract. That is after one month, the cash flow between uh, the floating rate of interest and uh, the fixed rate of interest will happen. So let us see actually how this uh, uh, interest rate computation happens actually for the floating rate and how the uh, cash flows are getting exchanged at the maturity of the contract. So now this is an example which you have taken. The date of trade is uh, uh, was the 12th October 2020 for a notional value of 100 crores and uh, the effective date it is on a T plus one basis that is the cash flows or interest will start accruing from 13th October 2020 and the maturity date of the contract happens to be on 13th November 2020. Then the fixed rate of interest is 3.65% uh, and the floating rate is linked to MIBOR overnight interest rate. So if you look at on one side, I have uh, uh, given the dates uh, for the one month tenor and also the days. Uh, why I have put these days actually is uh, important from uh, the calculation perspective. If you look at actually this, uh, these are all the various uh, uh, MIBOR fixes happened on various dates, overnight MIBOR. So 3.80, was the MIBOR rate uh, fixed for 13th October 2020 and on the and 3.95 was the rate actually fixed for Wednesday that is on the next day 14th October 2020. So this 3.80 3 is applicable for one day period. So for interest rate computation I am taking for 13th October the interest has to approve on the basis of 3.80 percent. So this is applicable for one day. Similarly for Wednesday the MIBOR rate 3.95% is made applicable for interest calculation. But coming to this Friday, coming to this Friday, the MIBOR fix was 3.90%. Uh, Since Saturday and Sunday happened to be holiday, this MIBOR 3.90% is applicable for three days. So where actually the holiday uh, falls actually uh, in between, the Previous business days interest rate is uh, my bar rate is considered is taken for the holidays uh, as well. So on all these 31 days and all these 31 days for the one month tenor, finally the my bar floating rate is computed as the compounded rate of interest, compounded my bar rate fixed for various dates during this one month uh, tenor. So interest has to be compounded on a daily basis. Wherever the inter holiday falls, the interest rates will be uh, computed on a simple interest basis. So on working days, it is on the computation happens on a compounded basis, where on the holidays, it happens on a simple calculation, a simple interest calculation basis. So like this, actually at the end of the tenor, the inter compounded uh, interest rate or uh, for the MIBOR for one month tenor is worked out 3.8064%. So based on the various fixes and based on the compounding. So now the fixed rate was fixed at uh, 3.65, whereas at the end of one month maturity, the compounded uh, MIBOR rate was 3.80%. So the difference between these two should be settled on the day of maturity. Now, 
on a 100 crore 3.65 percent the interest rate works out to the interest component works out to 31 lakhs and on the floating rate basis the interest component works out to 32.32 lakhs so now the difference of the difference between this fixed rate and the floating rate interest component uh, the net interest is 1.32 lakhs which has to be which has to be paid by the the which has to be received by the floating rate guy the fixed rate guy so whoever is buying that guy will access will get the net interest of 1.32 lakhs sorry because he pays lesser rate of interest on a fixed rate of interest that is 33.65 percent whereas on the floating rate since it happens to be no more than uh, fixed rate he receives from the floating rate. so this is how the computation of IRS uh, uh, is done in the market any questions on this still now otherwise move to the, i'll move to the next slide so like this actually this uh, the market uses uh, this is the typical interest rate uh, computation and the uh, the cash flows uh, computation for the interest rate uh, contracts and the market uh, as per the theory actually if you look at the, the interest rate uh, swap contracts can be used actually for converting uh, uh, your fixed rate uh, uh, liability or asset into your floating rate uh, asset or liability and also you can convert your floating rate asset or liability into a fixed rate asset or liability uh, like you now suppose you have uh, made an investment in uh, at the fixed rate of interest and if you expect actually the interest rate is to uh, go up in the near future then what you can do you can ideally enter into irs irs uh, contract where actually you will agree to pay fixed and also you will agree to receive floating so on your investment you will receive fixed rate of interest and in the irs contract you will be paying fixed rate of interest and you will be receiving floating rate of interest so if interest rate actually goes up since you are receiving floating rate of interest then you will continue to receive higher rate of interest that prevails in the market so this is how you can convert actually your fixed rate asset into your floating rate asset similarly if you want to convert actually a floating rate liability into a fixed rate liability then you can actually you will be receiving uh, and you expect actually the interest rate to go up in the market what you can do actually you can also enter into irs transaction where actually you will agree to receive floating rate and agree to pay fixed rate so where on the borrowing side you will be you will be paying floating rate uh, floating rate of interest and the irs transaction you will be receiving floating rate of interest and uh, you will be paying fixed rate of interest that is how you will be able to convert your floating rate uh, uh, liability into a fixed rate liability it all depends on actually what sort of interest rate you will have in the market so that and that can uh, happen in the near future so mostly if you look at uh, uh, that irs transactions what i have seen actually in the market mostly they are uh, used actually one is actually typically for the hedging purpose okay that is one part and even if you look at actually uh, the irs market only the foreign banks are quite active uh, your uh, private banks are uh, slightly active but the public sector banks are not at all active in this market since actually these foreign banks are having uh, are running the global books they are operating as brand, you know, uh, branches in uh, our country not as subsidiaries so they have this uh, global books so depending on the global books what kind of interest rate positions they have in their global books they can enter into uh, irs transaction in our domestic market so that is how actually these indian uh, foreign banks are more active in this market and sometimes actually this market uh, uh, is uh, using actually this interest rate swap transactions for making arbitrage opportunities uh in the market so let us uh, take an example how this market uh, uses interest rate swap market uh, for you know making any arbitrage transactions so in our uh, uh, they will always look at actually the interest rates prevailing in uh, various markets to see actually if there are any anomalies or any uh, inefficiencies in the market pricing of interest rates so they uh, they step into that uh, market and uh, take uh, advantage of such arbitrages or inefficiencies in the, in the market so we have this uh, interbank call market which is a very active market uh, uh, that is actually the street that is uh, happening uh, that is actually the borrowing and lending takes place uh, uh, in the market on an uncollateralized basis uh, among uh, the banking uh, uh, entities and also the primary dealers and uh, we have uh, active uh, interest rate swap transaction very nicely this uh, uh, my bar based benchmark is very active and we have uh, a reasonable, uh, reasonably active CD and CP market in our, in, our, in our domestic markets. So I'm just looking at an arbitrage, how this arbitrage transaction can be structured uh, 
uh, in the stream or using in the in the stream market now in the uh, based on the interest rates prevailing in uh, these three markets so i am looking at actually currently uh, the cd uh, the certificates of deposits for a, having a six month maturity uh, yields around 3.75% on the other side, if you look at this uh, IRS uh, fixed rate, uh, uh, fixed rate, uh, IRS transaction is available at 3.55 percent. So that means actually there is a, there is a clear spread of uh, 20 basis points, uh, 20 basis points between these two markets. So if you are able to invest uh, in the CD market, you will be getting a return of around 3.75 percent. Whereas if you do a IRS transaction, then actually you agree to pay fixed rate of interest, and you will be paying only 3.55 percent. So that is how you can make actually uh, 20 basis points uh, uh, spread between these two markets. So now what I will do, but for investing in uh, certificates or deposits, I require funds. So what I will do, I will borrow in the interbank uh, call money market. The call money market, the rates are based on the my rates. They are my rates, right? So when I borrow overnight in the uh, interbank market, so I am just paying my rates. So I borrow funds in the interbank market. I invest the process in the certificates or deposits market for a six month maturity. So now in this transaction, I will be paying the rates linked to my bar and I will be receiving at the end of six months, the CD rate of around 3.75%. So now I'll have to see actually the swap transaction. I'll have to enter into a swap transaction. Wherein is I will be buying a swap contract, which is linked to again the my bar overnight rate. So when I say buying a uh, swap transfer, buying IRS contract, I am paying fixed rate of interest and I will be receiving the floating rate of interest that is again linked to my bar. So now on one side in the call market, I will be paying the my bar rate on the swap transaction. I will be receiving my bar rate. So the net effect is zero. Whereas on other side, the fixed rate of interest, if you look at, I will be getting around 3.75% yield from my CD investment and I will be paying around 3.55% the swap transaction. So now my floating rate linked liability and floating rate linked uh, uh, the cash flows in the swap contract are nullified. So what I am what is remaining is the fixed rate of interest that is a spread which I which I am making between 3.75% and 3.55%. So this is a kind of arbitrage transaction that the market makes use of now by looking at actually various uh, uh, inefficiencies of uh, interest rate pricing in different markets. So we have seen actually so many transactions are happening in the market based on this kind of uh, arbitrage opportunities. Any queries still now? Can you explain the arbitrage transaction once again? Yeah. So now I am operating in different markets. As an entity, I am operating in different markets. I have access to call money market. That is the interbank market. And I have access to investment in CD market. And I have access to doing swap contracts in the interest rate swap market. So what I am looking at actually, in the CD market, the current six month interest rate is going at around 3.75%. Whereas on the other side, the fixed rate of interest, the fixed cost in the interest rate swap market is going at around 3.55%. So now I am looking at actually, so okay, when I invest actually in the six month CD market, I will be able to get around 3.75%. Whereas if I enter into a swap contract, that is if I buy a swap contract, I will be paying a fixed rate of interest at 3.55%. So on one side, I will be receiving 3.15. On the other side, I will be paying 3.55%. So clearly there is a spread opportunity of around 20 basis points, right? This you agree? Yes, sir. Clear. Yeah. So now what I'll do if I want to make investment in the CD market, then I require funds. Right. So I will borrow actually in the call money market. That is the interbank market at a my bar rate. Right. So since actually I will be able to borrow to overnight since the, our money market is restricted, mostly the transactions are restricted to overnight transaction and the market is very active market. I don't have any fear of actually you know, whether I'll be able to roll over my borrowings. So I am borrowing in the interbank market, say 100 crores, and I will be investing that 100 crores in the CD market for 3.75% for a six month period. At the same time, I am entering into a swap contract, wherein actually I am buying a swap contract. I agree to pay 3.55% and 
I agree to pay the floating rate of interest, which is linked to again my bar. So at the end of six months, at the end of six months, I will have to pay the compounded the my bar rate in the overnight market, the Calmany market. I will be paying that, right? And I will be receiving in the interest rate swap transaction the floating rate interest again linked to the compounded my bar rate for six month period. So I am paying six month uh, the compounded my bar rate. For a six month period in the call market, whereas on the receiving in the interest of market a six month uh, compounded my bar rate, so effect is zero because the same the benchmark is same in both markets, right? Okay, sir. so what is left out is actually the CD market investment which is yielding around 3.75 percent on the swap transaction. I'm paying 3.5 percent, so I'm just making a clear arbitrage profit of 0 0.20 percent, but it's a good without, without making any investment. From my own funds. Yes, sir. It's clear now. Got, is it clear now? Yes, sir. It's clear. Yeah. Thank you. Now, again, this once this uh, interested uh, swap contracts are entered, uh, uh, the daily mark to market valuation of the interested uh, contract is done, uh, whether it is a bilaterally. Uh, you entered a, a bilaterally entered contract or the contract are settled through another central counterparty which is a clearing corporation so every day the valuation of the irs contract uh, is done in the market <clears throat> as i said actually at the inception of the contract or at the beginning of the contract the net present value of uh, the cash flows arising out of your fixed rate of interest and the net cash flows the present value of the net cash flows arising out of your floating rate of interest should exactly be equal there should not be any arbitrage so that is why actually we always say the net mark to market value should be zero at the inception of the irs contract but if you move over to subsequent days in the life of the contract the floating rate doesn't remain at the same level right the floating rate changes depending on the prevailing uh, market conditions <clears throat> so your mark to market value of your floating rate uh, uh, cash flows will vary so now i'll have to do a calculation how to uh, do the mark to market values of the contracts. So what is the present value of the interest rates of contract? So anyway, based on the fixed rate, which is already fixed for the entire life of the contract, we know uh, certain the cash flows that happens actually at the periodical intervals during the life of the contract. So that interest component is arrived at. So now on the floating rate, uh, floating uh, rate side, if you know, I know only the current rate, but I don't know the, the future rates, right? So for the current period, I can work out actually what is the future cash flows that can get exchanged at some point of time, right? But the future cash flows, the rates for the future cash flows, I don't know what will be the rate. So there, I say they are called forward rates. So in our market, normally we have this uh, government securities uh, yield to maturity yield curve is there. Uh, from the traded uh, uh, the yields of the government securities in the market, the uh, participants or the clearing corporation there is zero coupon yield curve based on uh, various interpolation techniques uh, mostly they are using this uh, linear interpolation in uh, uh, arriving at the zero coupon yield curve from the zero coupon yield curve they compute actually what would be the forward rate so when i say forward rate the forward rate is actually for a future period at the end of a specified period suppose in this suppose uh, uh, six monthly cash flows IRS contract for the first six months anyway it is known what would be the rate actually for the next six months at the end of six months right the my bar is fixed for six months assume this is the case my, my bar is fixed for six months for the current period i know what is the my bar rate for the first six months but at the end of six months what would be the my bar rate for the next six months that means from now onwards till the end of 12 months so what would be the rate of interest so that is a forward rate. So the market derives this forward rate from the zero coupon yield curve, which is again derived from the uh, traded uh, uh, the yields of government of India securities. So once the forward rates are added at, so we know on the fixed rate side, what would be the cash flows? And we are worried at what would be the forward rates for different periods uh, during the life of the contract. And we also compute what would be the cash flows based on the forward rates. So we have this fixed rate, we have the forward, uh, forward rates cash flows now. So again, you have to do discounting all these uh, for all these cash flows by using again the zero rates. 
so once the discounting is done you know the present you have the present value of your fixed rate cash flows and also you have the present value of the future floating like uh, cash flows then the difference between these two cash flows would be the mock to market value of the so contract if the present value of the fixed rate fixed leg, uh, fixed leg is higher than this 40 leg then the fixed rate payer has to pay a margin to the counterparty or margin to the clearing corporation on the other side if floating rate is less or floating leg uh, i mean uh, the fixed rate is the present value of the fixed rate is less than uh, floating rate then the floating rate payer has to the floating rate uh, uh, payer has to pay a <coughs> margin to the uh, counterparty or margin to the clearing corporation so this is how the mark to market value of the uh, irs contracts is uh, worked out on a daily basis during the life of the contract by the market and during the life of the contract there are uh, uh, cancellation also can happen uh, of the uh, cancellation can happen uh, by the, the the during the life of the contract the market the participants can negotiate with each other and they can uh, arrive at some cancel the contract so why this cancellation has to happen since actually these are all the bilateral uh, market one counterparty enters into a uh, swap contract with one counterparty and he will uh, say buy swap contract and he will also sell uh, swap contract with another counterparty so in his books if you look at he has uh, lots of buy swaps and uh, sell swaps uh, remaining in the uh, irs uh, book so what is the uh, what is the problem actually you know if we have more number of transactions like you no know, for buy and sell in your books and all these irs transactions are done based on the notional principal amount so when it is done the notional principal amount if you look at the market value of even the uh, the notional principal amount say 100 crores if you look at ideally for the mark to market value of the contract maybe five percent of this uh, notional amount so that means the mark to market value may be around five crores what is effectively getting exchanged between the counterparties is only five crores not the hundred crores so that is why it is always called the notional principal amount but if you look at these banking entities wherein actually rbi has uh, prescribed the capital requirement how much capital has to be maintained by the bank center bank entities for the unbalanced sheets and all anyway the risk weights uh, are assigned to uh, their uh, uh, various assets so based on the various uh, risk weighted assets uh, then uh, uh, the interest calculator the capital calculation happens for the off balance sheet items like you know the derivative transaction uh, it has to be shown on a gross notional principal suppose you have a buy transaction for one year contract say for 100 crores and we have a sell transaction for uh, sell or transaction for another 100 crores then you have to maintain capital on this entire 200 crores right not on the mark to market value of the contract so the capital has to be maintained on the gross notional and not on the mark to market value so that is where actually the banks will end up actually uh, maintaining more capital uh, uh, for their derivative transactions and the capital has you know they have a cost right it's not available free the capital has its own cost so that is where actually uh, the market actually periodically they come uh, the, the periodically they try to see actually you know in their books how many buys and how many uh, sales of the swap contracts are there in the books and how many such contracts actually we can offset against each other so that means if i have a, a buy contract uh, for a one month maturity and i also have a sell contract with another counterparty for 100 uh, same maturity for one year maturity in my books now i will enter into a i will just um, approach a clearing corporation which can do this uh, offsetting of contracts between two different counterparties because this uh, central counterparties you know there is a clearing corporation they always uh, do the netting on a multilateral multilateral basis so when i do this uh, on the multi when i say multilateral basis <coughs> the obligations or the outstanding amounts of a particular counterparty is worked out based on his transactions with multiple counterparties he can have buy transactions he can have sell transactions with the various counterparties all those buy and sell transactions are pulled together at the clearing corporation and finally they try to offset wherever possible they try to offset uh, the buy and sell contracts that is opposite uh, contracts and finally they are out a net obligation or a single obligation so that is where uh, that is that is how this uh, multilateral netting uh, principle is worked out by the clearing corporations so they approach actually this uh, clearing corporation and they hand over all these uh, uh, the, the books of uh, interested uh, portfolio 
and the clearing corporation uses uh, certain logic such to work out you know, to see how many such buy contracts and how many such sell contracts can uh, be offset uh, uh, with each other so that finally all those contracts can be removed from the interested uh, uh, portfolio of the uh, of, of a particular entity so when they do such uh, uh, cancellations the capital has to be maintained by these uh, institutions only for the remaining uh, outstandings so in order to conserve this capital or in order to minimize the capital requirement for these uh, uh, derivatives exposures they always uh, they often uh, for cancellation of the contracts so in india if you look at uh, the clearing corporation of india limited ccl is acting as a central counterparty for otc derivatives they offer uh, this kind of cancellation services through trade compression <clears throat> So the trade compression services are offered by Clearing Corporation of India Limited to market participants, uh, maybe a once in half year or once a year, the, they approach the market or the market approaches Clearing Corporation and request for a series of sort of trade cancellation uh, in their books so that the capital requirement for such uh, the entities will come down. So this is how this uh, cancellation uh, of the contract. When they do cancellation, what happens? <clears throat> so they cancel actually the buy contract with the sell contract. So on one buy contract, suppose he's a buyer of uh, the contract, that means he pays fixed rate of interest and he receives floating. Again, the MIBOR rate. On the sell side of the swap contract, he receives fixed and he pays floating. So in these two contracts, one contract is receiving uh, uh, floating and one con another contract he pays floating. So this nullifies each other so what is remaining is the the difference between the two fixed rates of the buy and sell uh, contracts so the cash flows or valuation based on the difference between these two fixed rates will get exchanged when uh, the cancellation of the contract is done by the So any uh, queries till now? Okay, then I'll move to the next slide. So these are all about this uh, MIBOR based IRS contracts. Now we come to this uh, MIFOR contract. <clears throat> so MIFOR, as I said, it is very unique in India. Uh, the MIFAR is a Mumbai Interbank forward offer rate. So unfortunately in our uh, uh, country, the money markets are restricted to a one day maturity. Mostly they remain overnight uh, uh, markets. So that means the borrowing and lending of funds take, uh, taking place in this uh, money markets are for only one day maturity. Uh, if you look at uh, the CCL India side, where naturally this money market transactions and the rates are published uh, on a daily basis on, the, on all business days. So mostly the tenor for uh, uh, these money markets are for one day maturity. So if I want to know actually what is the uh, interest rate, you know, that ideal interest rate actually for uh, a three month tenor or for a six month tenor, if somebody wants to uh, lend or borrow in a rupee market, then what should, what, what, what should be the ideal interest rate? Which benchmark I should refer to for fixing uh, the interest rate for my transactions? So what is the benchmark? So unfortunately, this kind of, uh, since the, the market uh, is not actually developed beyond overnight, so we don't have any uh, term money uh, yield curve, uh, uh, we, we don't have any term money yield curve. So when you don't have any term money yield curve, then you don't have any benchmark actually for uh, fixing rate of interest for different maturities in the short end of the yield curve. So market as uh, our Indian market as you know uh, is very active on the money market space for one day maturity and it is also active on the forex market. So our uh, market has uh, found an innovative way how we can make use of this forex market that is especially the uh, dollar uh, rupee market to a fixed rate of interest for the Indian rupee market, right? So we have, uh, fortunately, we have very active uh, dollar rupee market, the spot market. Also, we have very active uh, uh, forward market. The forward market is active up, uh, from one month to 12 month period. So we have act both active spot market and we have both uh, 
uh, forward market. So now, ideally, uh, uh, yeah, typical transaction can be said so that to arrive at what could be the rupee cost of uh, the cost of funds for a rupee transaction. So now what I'm looking at actually the market can uh, since we have a, a huge forex market we can borrow dollar at a LIBOR rate as in the borrow dollar at a LIBOR rate and sell that amount at low spot rate prevailing in the market. So when I say borrow dollar market at LIBOR rate for a particular maturity say for a three month maturity. So I am borrowing dollars paying a LIBOR prevailing at that point of time for three months period. So now I am getting the dollars and I am converting the dollars into rupee by selling it in the spot market. Right. So spot market is active. So I am generating no rupee amount now. So when I'm doing this transaction. What is the risk I'm exposed to? The LIBOR rate is already fixed. Right, the current LIBOR rate is fixed actually for my future cash flow for a three month period. So, LIBOR rate is known, LIBOR rate is fixed now. So, I don't have any interest rate risk. Whereas, on the other side, I am borrowing dollar and I am converting into a rupee for a three month period. After three months, I'll have to pay back actually dollar along with interest. The spot rate which is prevailing now may not remain at the same level after three month period. So, I, the, I am exposed to exchange a currency exchange rate risk right if the, the, the rupee it all depends on actually rupee depreciation or appreciation my the dollar requirement actually will go up or will come down so now <clears throat> in order to address this uh, exchange rate risk i will enter into a forward contract the forward contract market is also active i am getting a quote actually in the forward market for a three month period now so i am entering into a transaction in the forward market so that my exchange rate risk is covered now. So I borrow dollar, I convert this dollar into INR, and at the same time, I am entering into a forward contract for a three month period for the principal amount which I am going to, which I'll have to pay after three months along with the interest. So my exchange rate risk is protected now. So now in the forward market, for getting this code, for getting this entry into, for entering into a forward contract, I have to pay certain premium to the guy who is selling this forward contract to me, right? So that fee is my cost. So I have two costs in this transaction. One is actually the LIBOR is the cost for my borrowing. The other cost is the forward premium that is in the form of forward premium to protect my exchange rate risk. So these two rates together should be the rate at which actually I should be able to invest the rupee in the market my rupee investment in this market should be able to generate or should be able to give me that return which should be equal to my labor cost plus forward premium cost so that is the break even rate so now since actually we have got this labor rate and the forward premium rate whatever the rate i am getting by clubbing these two rates is my rupee rate for the domestic market so this is how actually the my four rate this this rate is called my four rate so this is how the market computes the my four rates the rupee i mean implied rupee rate any uh, questions on this okay so the MIFA rate is uh, arrived based on the LIBOR cost and uh, the forward premium cost prevailing in the Forex market. So this is how using the Forex market I am generating a rupee interest rate. So how this MIFA is com uh, MIFA computed? MIFA is computed again based on the forward premium and the LIBOR rate for the period. So this uh, calculation, uh, this formula is published by uh, Finda in its uh, handbook. So my forward is equal to spot rate plus uh, forward points divided by uh, spot rate, which is again uh, multiplied with uh, the LIBOR rate one plus LIBOR rate. The LIBOR rate applicable for uh, the period N1 is the LIBOR period. Uh, the LIBOR rate actually for the applicable period. Then whatever uh, uh, the resultant, it has to be again 
uh, converted uh, uh, i mean it has to be annualized by uh, using actually actual number of days in the forex market always the use is uh, 30 uh, by 360 that is the day count convention in the forex market whereas in our rupee market we always use this actual by 365 days so when i say n1 here n1 is based on the 30 by 360 whereas the n2 is actual by 365 so i am just looking at, i am just combining this uh, combining this forward rate uh, uh, premium plus the libor rate and i am annualizing it by using this uh, indian uh, uh, market day count convention so libor for 3 months assume this is the case libor for 3 months is 0.33% whereas the 3 month forward premium is uh, 50 by 50 by paisa spot rate is 74.39 this is the spot rate and uh, 3 month period it has 90 days that is n1 n2 is the number of actual number of days between this uh, in this three month period that is in this case actually i have taken 92 days so the my for is 74.39 that is the spot rate plus the forward premium 55 paisa upon 75.39 that is again multiplied with the, the libor rate libor rate applicable the 3.33 percent applicable for 90 days and again the resultant is annualized by using by multiplying it by 365 days so the rate we got is around 3.3.26 percent so the my for rate is 3.26 percent this 3.26 percent if i am able to bring dollar and i convert it into inr and if i invest that rupee rupee in this domestic market i should be able to get a return of 3.26 percent so that my cost of borrowing in libor market and also the fee i am paying in the forward market should exactly be equal to the return generated in the rupee market so this is the break even rate and this is the rupee interest this should be the rupee interest rate prevailing in the domestic market 3.26 percent so this is how actually market fixes uh, the rupee interest rate from the forex market Again, this MIFAR has some market conventions. Again, uh, FIMTA has specified uh, uh, what are the various market conventions. So here also the minimum uh, notional principal amount uh, uh, for transacting in this IRS market with underlying MIFAR rates is rupees 5 crores. But market generally considers uh, 25 crores is the one lot actually for uh, uh, this MIFAR market. And at tenor again, uh, there are no restrictions. And mostly if you look at uh, two three and five years up uh, uh, my first swaps are uh, most liquid uh, tenors and the trading hours again it is uh, between 9 a.m and uh, uh, 5 p.m on weekdays then here the effective date uh, the trade date is the date on which the trade is executed whereas the effective date is a t plus two basis whereas on the my uh, uh, irs contract the effective date is a t plus one whereas on the for the my four rate it is a t plus two why in the sense my four market is quoting based on the forex market in the forex market again the rates are based on the spot market the spots market is again the settlement happens on a t plus two basis so that is why the effective date is always t plus two uh, for the my transactions again the business uh, day convention is modified following business day convention if the cash flow date or maturity date falls on a holiday then the subsequent business day will be the effective date for uh, such cash flows or uh, or such settlement settlement Again, as uh, cash flow exchange uh, for uh, one year swap up to one year swap contract, the quarterly cash flow, quarterly exchange of uh, cash flows will happen. Whereas the contracts are beyond one year maturity, the cash flows uh, are getting exchanged at the half yearly intervals. So these are all the standard uh, market conventions that is uh, being followed in the MIFA market. I'm just looking at actually how I can make use of this uh, my four market to see actually whether I can make use of this my four rates uh, uh, to look at you know, any uh, arbitrage opportunities I can make use of this in the you know, by looking at uh, uh, the my four rate and also the rates uh, prevailing in the domestic market. 
rates and i say actually domestic market maybe actually a cp or cd or t bill rate i can look at if my for rate <coughs> if my for rate happens to be if, uh, uh, less than actually my domestic interest rate then i can very well uh, borrow in the usd dollar market i can uh, uh, generate rupee i invest in uh, rupee market generate more return and then i pay in the labor market so what kind of arbitrage opportunity that can uh, exist in this uh, fx market so i'm just looking at actually now i know the my for rate i just take an example i'm just looking at uh, compare this my for rate with a 91 day table rate so the 91 day table rate actually is say assumed five percent whereas the my bar rate uh, my for rate based on this uh, libor rate for a three month uh, maturity and also the forward premium uh, for a three month uh, period my my for cost works out to say 4.0742 percent so my for is 4.07 percent and the 91 day table rate is five percent so if i if i can generate rupee and i invest it in 91 day table rate then i will be getting a return of five percent whereas the dollar funds which i am uh, which i can raise to generate rupee at a particular LIBOR rate and also the forward premium which I'm going to pay to protect my exchange rate raise, the cost is going to be less <clears throat> because it comes to 4.07%. So my MIFR is less than table rate, 5%. So what I'll do, I'll typically borrow in the dollar market and I convert it into rupee at the spot rate and I enter into a forward uh, three month contract by paying certain premium amount to protect my exchange rate risk so here in this example my spot rate 100 million dollars uh, i'm just borrowing and uh, i'm converting this into rupee at 73.50 percent my three month uh, forward premium annualized basis it works out to 3.73 percent cost so the forward rate which i'll have to pay to buy dollar after three months is 74.1854 so this is the dollar rate this is the rupee i'm just going to pay for by one dollar at the end of three months so now the rupee converted using the spot rate of 73.50 for the 100 million notional uh, for 100 million dollar i will be able to realize 735 crores in the rupee and i will be i am investing this entire 735 crores at five percent rate of interest which is again going to give me an interest rate of around 9.16 crores for a three month for a 91 day so the maturity of uh, the process from uh, tbl investment it comes to 7.744 uh, crores now i like to buy dollar to the extent of 100.082 million so that means this 82,500 is the libor interest which i like to pay for my 100 million dollar borrowing so for buying this uh, dollars i am required to pay based on this 74.1854 this is the amount that is 742.46 crores i am going to pay for buying dollar and repay my dollar borrowing whereas on the <coughs> tv investment i got 744 crores on my repayment dollar repayment i'll have to pay 742 crores the difference of 1.69 crores is the gain i'm making out of this arbitrage <clears throat> so i always compare actually you know if my LIBOR rate borrowing cost plus my forward premium cost if it is going to be less than my domestic interest rate cost then i'll be in this kind of uh, uh, transaction in the market on the contrary, if my domestic interest rate is less than the MIFO rate, then I can do the reverse transaction. Wherein actually I will buy, I will borrow in rupee, I convert this into dollar in the spot market, and again I will enter into a, a forward contract for selling dollars at a forward premium, so that my forward selling dollars at a forward premium. When I'm selling dollars in the market for the, in the forward market, I will be receiving premium. If I am buying uh, in the forward market, I'll have to pay premium. So if I sell, I'll be receiving premium. And by investing in dollar, 
I will be getting LIBOR interest rate. So this rate actually will be more than what the rate I am going to pay for my INR borrowing in the domestic market. So that kind of reverse uh, arbitrage opportunity also I can make use of if there is a differential uh, between the two interest rates. Any questions on this? Yes, sir. I have one question, sir. Yeah, please. Uh, with regards to this uh, arbitrage process, actually, whether there exists any interest rate difference, one thing. And then what about the transaction cost? When you want to convert a rupee into dollar and a dollar into then investment, is, uh, many transactions take place in between now. Uh, so what is the transaction cost then i uh, actually uh, my uh, my view is that uh, the benefit if there is any will be nullified with regards to this transaction cost otherwise people will be doing this uh, such arbitrage transaction plenty of now yeah yeah definitely this kind of arbitrage opportunities are existing in the market right okay so that is where i see this uh, money market and forex market no they are very active in our uh, country okay so the transaction cost actually which you are talking about is the what is the cost actually of my transaction one is the interest rate that is the interest cost which say whether i am going to borrow in uh, rupee or i am going to borrow in dollar that interest of interest cost is fixed now so in addition to this cost what is it extra i will have to pay for my arbitrage transaction so that is the exchange rate risk which i am which you want to protect yourself against any uh, dollar rupee movement right for which actually you have to do a forward transaction in the forward transaction there is a cost involved to that that is additional cost okay so your interest cost plus your forward premium cost the forward premium which you are going to pay in the forward market if the difference actually if the some of these two uh, components is greater than actually what you are going to invest or what you are going to generate actually in the uh, domestic market then there is an arbitrage opportunity existing in the market Right. Always I try to compare the market always compares because the forex market is also active and on the other side if you look at R RBI always comes out with actually this 90 minute T bill 182 on a regular basis, right? So you have these opportunities uh, available in the market always market makes use of this uh, arbitrages The only problem actually you know the only uh, the only uh, concern here only concern here is if you are able to borrow and if you are able to convert the currencies and you are you, you should be able to convert the currencies and you should be able to enter into forward contracts on the same day right and you should also be able to do the transaction the domestic market also on the same day suppose actually you borrow dollar you convert it uh, convert it convert this dollar into rupee right on a t plus two basis then on t plus two basis you should be able to enter into a forward contract to does this exchange rate risk so that is one another thing when you realize the amount you should be able to invest that amount on the same day right so everything as to all these transactions have to happen on t plus two basis that is on the same day in order to avoid any kind of mispricing or any kind of basis uh, risk if the timing is different then you will not have uh, such kind of no arbitrages if if you are able to time all these transactions perfectly then you will have arbitrage opportunities and you will have to you will be able to uh, make profits uh, sir yeah uh, sir can you name some uh, uh, institutional investors who are actively involved in uh, such kind of arbitrage sir no these are all actually banks normally you know they have this opportunity of uh, uh, doing this kind of arbitrages Okay, so in because India, which all banks are uh, involved sorry? in this? In sorry? India, which all banks are involved in this, sir? No, Institution over is active. Almost, sir, if you look at uh, the banks are very active, like the uh, State Bank of India, no, the foreign banks, SDC Bank, Axis Bank, all banks are active in this market. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. <clears throat> 
so typically if you look at in the forex market in india we have this uh, spot market uh, for doing uh, transactions on the spot basis so here also we have this cash tom spot cash in the sense if you want to sell or buy dollar in a cash basis the settlement happens on the same day and uh, on a tom basis the settlement happens on a t plus one day and the spot market again the settlement happens on a t plus two basis right and the forward market depending on the tenor of uh, the forwards in addition to that we have another active market that is fx swap market now so that means actually swapping of uh, your currencies right especially the dollar rupee swap market is very active in our uh, country so that is where actually you know they look at the swap market of the swap market what kind of uh, transactions are happening and in the forward market uh, what kind of fees is going and the what kind of actually uh, the rupee rate going on in the market so they look at all these markets and uh, what kind of interest rates you know what sort of interest rates prevailing in all these markets and if any arbitrage opportunity exists then they take uh, advantage of those arbitrages clear so now this is typically irs market watch uh, hosted by uh, uh, clary corporation of india limited uh, so these are all for various tenors these are all for the rolling tenors one month two month three month six month you know up to 10 year standard uh, tenors available in the market and these are all the uh, rates at which the transactions were executed and this is uh, another platform asteroid the previous one if you look at this irs market watch is uh, uh, we have two kinds of uh, 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 transactions that is happening in the market one is actually the whatever the transactions know excluded uh, executed in the otc market they have to be reported on uh, the reporting platform hosted by uh, clary corporation of india limited so this platform is the reporting platform where actually the market reports the transactions and the rates are display to the market on a transparency and this is asteroid asteroid is the anonymous uh, uh, trading platform again it is uh, hosted by uh, clearing corporation of india limited and uh, wherein actually here uh, the counterparties are not no known to each other whatever the trades concluded on this uh, asteroid platform so they are uh, uh, settled through clearing corporation of india limited and uh, the valuation of irs contracts and the settlement of cash flows and the resetting of interest rates at free you know, for the floating rate benchmarks so all post trade activities are carried out by clearing corporation of india limited for the trades executed on this asteroid platform and this is the market overview what uh, how how big is our uh, uh, interest rates of market so here if you look at uh, the foreign banks are very active with a market share of around 44.77 uh, percent uh, private sector banks uh, uh, around 34.29 percent market share whereas the primary dealers 18.71 percent public sector banks is only 0.2.23 so in this market if you look at the foreign banks are most active players followed by private sector banks and this is the outstanding uh, uh, notional amount <clears throat> around uh, 2 trillion uh, rupees is the notional amount outstanding in this interest rate of market myba market and this is the myfa market share again the myfa market also if you look at uh, the same order uh, uh, of foreign banks private sector banks and the public sector banks are having market share again this is uh, between mybor and my myfa mybor is very active market with around 85.67 percent in 2007-2008 it was only myfa was only 14.33 percent market share but currently if you look at uh, mybor is having around 75% market share uh, 25% by uh, myfa slowly the myfa market is uh, growing the 
that's all about the the interest rates of market then we'll move to this uh, forward rate agreements the forward rate agreement is again uh, a contract between two counterparties to exchange uh, interest payment based on a notional principle for a specified period to begin at a future date this is just like a forward rate the forward rate agreement is based on the forward rate when i say forward rate we have already discussed about the forward rate now the forward is the forward rate forward rate actually is the rate that would be prevailing for a particular period at the end of certain period right so if a three month rate is available in the market a six month rate is available in the market so now assume actually this is a scenario where actually you have investment opportunity for a three month period and also you have the investment opportunity for six month period and uh, the currently the interest rate uh, for a three month period maybe say four percent and uh, for a six month period the interest rate may be some five percent so now either you can invest directly for a six month period you have a surplus uh, cash of you no know, investment cash of around says for a six month period you have two opportunities either you can directly invest for a six month period uh, for five percent or you can invest for three month period at four percent and you can roll over after three months for a three month period right so this is the kind of uh, 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 the kind of investment that you can make actually between these two opportunities so now when you invest actually for a three month period and you want to roll it over for the next three month period but you don't know what will be the interest rate for three month period at the end of three months right so that three month period the forward period at the end of three months is the forward rate so the forward rate actually is should be in such a way that you invest for three months and you roll it over for three months at the forward rate should yield exactly the amount equivalent to your investment directly for a six month period right so this is the uh, parity actually between these two periods so this is the forward rate so now yeah an entity suppose you have uh, uh, a requirement of funds actually to borrow in the market for a three month period maybe after three months right but you don't know what will be the rate actually after three months at what rate i will be able to borrow in the market your expectation may or even you may be the interest rate may go up actually for uh, in the near future so that if i borrow now i may be borrowing at a lesser rate whereas if i make my borrowing at the end you know, after three months then i may be paying slightly higher rates so i have uh, that kind of that kind of concern in my mind <clears throat> then i can uh, always do a forward rate agreement uh, with uh, the counterparties in the market whoever is willing to quote me uh, the rates for uh, uh, such forward periods so here the terminology is uh, no three by six so when i say three by six it is an agreement to exchange interest payment for a three month period starting three months from now so when i say three by six months i have a fixed rate here and i have a floating rate which is going to be fixed actually at the end of three months for next three month period so that is a floating rate so a buyer of forward rate agreement will agree to pay the fixed rate what is currently prevalent in the market for a floating rate which is going to be fixed at a future period so when i sell from i will be receiving fixed rate that is what currently prevalent in the market and i am ready to pay the benchmark rate which is going to be set actually you know after a at the end of three months so if my view is actually the interest rate is to go down i will be selling from if my interest rate is going to go up i will be buying from <clears throat> it is also a kind of uh, interest rate swap interest rate swap is also exchange of cash flows between the fixed rate and the floating rate and the forward rate agreement also is the exchange of cash flow between the fixed rate and the floating rate the only difference is the forward rate agreement is for a one period whereas the interest rate swap can be for one period and can for multiple periods during the life of the contract that means <coughs> the settlement of cash flows can happen in multiple periods during the life of the contract in interest rate swap contract whereas the forward rate agreement is only one set of cash flow payment i can call it as a subset of interest rate swap another difference actually between this forward rate agreement and the interest rate swap contract is the in the interest rate swap contract the exchange of cash flow happens <coughs> in arrear basis that is at the end of the cash flow period the settlement of cash flow happens or exchange of cash flow happens whereas in the forward rate agreement <coughs> typically in by 3 by 6 uh, fra that means 
the rate fixed at the end of three months for the in the subsequent three months the cash flow ideally has to get exchanged at the end of six months right now the higher the fixed rate and have the floating rate benchmark at the end of six months the cash flow has to happen as per the irs contract at the end of six months period in the fri market what happens actually the cash flow settlement happens at the beginning of the future period so at the end of three months at the end of three months even though cash flow will start accruing from that the period after uh, three months the settlement will happen at the end of three months on a discounted basis at the prevailing rate of interest so it is just like a discounted payment instead of arrears it will be done in advance so here also the terminologies uh, remain same notional sum trade date effective date settlement date all those uh, contract period the flow rate reference rate the settlement sum the settlement actually happens as the difference between the fixed rate and the reference rate on a discounted basis at the start of the contract this is a typical quote uh, uh, for fra so if i say 6 by 9 months 7.20% and 7.30% that means the bank accepts to pay 7.20% that is but receive agree to receive 7.30% fixed rate so this is what the typical quote in the market but if you look at the currently the uh, flow market is not active uh, in india so this is an example a corporate has an accept, expected requirement for funds for 3 months after 3 months but is concerned that interest rates may head uh, higher from current levels the corporate can enter into a fra to hedge or fix its borrowing cost today for the loan to be raised after 3 months the rate agreed to fra has to be compared to the benchmark rate to determine the settlement therefore the corporate buys 3 by 6 fra from a bank say at uh, 3.25% right at a 3.75% that is a current fixed rate so the same example the terms of uh, contract are given in this slide so the fixed rate agreed between the corporate and the bank is 3.25% for a floating rate benchmark which is going to be fixed at the end of 3 months for the subsequent 3 month period so what happens actually if the benchmark rate happens to be 3.75% at the end of 3 uh, months so the cash flow calculation happens based on the 3.75% and also on the fixed rate 3.25% because the corporate buys the pro contract and it has agreed to pay fixed rate of 3.25% the amount of interest is computed based on the 3.25% for the 90 days period that is the number of days between this uh, in this 3 months and what is what should be the amount payable by the bank the amount payable by the bank is based on the 3.75% which is the benchmark set at the end of 3 months that amount is also worked out now the difference between these two cash flows is 1.26 lakhs and ideally this 1.26 lakhs should be settled at the end of 3 months or from now onwards at the end of 6 months since it is a 3 by 6 uh, fra from now onwards the settlement of cash flows of this 1.26 lakhs should happen at the end of 6 months since in the fra contract the settlement has to be done in advance basis that means at the end of 3 months now or at the end of maturity of the fra contract this 1.26 lakhs is discounted at the prevailing the benchmark rate that is again 3.75% which comes to 1.24 lakhs so this is the amount of settlement at the end of the fra contract that will be done so the the company the corporate is going to receive from the bank 1,24,000 even though the corporate is able to issue cp or is able to make borrowing at the prevailing rate of 3.75% it has already received the difference between 3.75 and 3.25% from the bank from the fra transaction so it has already fixed its borrowing cost at 3.25% at the beginning of the period itself so this is how they can make use of this from market to fix their cost of borrowings now i'm just uh, taking a case for analysis 
suppose a manufacturing firm borrows uh, uh, rupees 100 crores from the bank at my bar plus one percent so this is the interest that the bank charges uh, uh, to the manufacturing firm for a 100 crore transaction and the firm actually expects uh, the rate may raise and wants to lock in the fixed interest it wants to fix the interest rate now itself right and the transaction actually this uh, uh, transaction is for a two year time period and the otc from market and the irs market the following uh, codes are available in the from market 0 by 6 5.90 percent so this rate is already known because we are in the current period for the next six months this is a fixed cost fixed rate in the from market whereas in the 6 by 12 market that is at the end of six months for the subsequent six months the rate of interest based on the forward rate calculation it comes to six percent again the forward rate for uh, 12 by 18 uh, fraud contract it is 6.10 percent and 18 by 24 it is 6.20 percent so these are all the rates prevailing in the fraud market for four different periods in the two years term and if you come to this irs market the my bar with the underlying uh, my bar overnight for a two years irs contract the fixed rate offered in the market is seven percent so somebody is ready to offer seven percent fixed rate in the irs market so now you have <clears throat> you have to decide whether i should go in for the from market transaction or i should go in for irs transaction so that my interest cost has to be fixed now i should not be subject to any uncertainty in the interest rate uh, future interest rate movement because my borrowing is linked to my borrow rate so i'll just doing a simple calculation stating that actually how much i will be paying to the bank based on the my bar plus one by one percent if i buy a swap contract a fraud contract and also i do a, a, a irs contract so how much actually interest cost i'll have to pay actually in this fraud transaction how much interest cost actually i can fix actually in the irs transaction so i can make a comparison between the fraud market and irs transfer irs market and i can look at actually which one is more suitable for me so with the bank anyway i have agreed to pay my bar plus one percent at every six months so this is my uh, cost to the bank and in the fraud market <coughs> I buy the from a fraud, fraud contract where actually I am willing to pay 5.90% for the period one and I receive my bar from the fraud counterparty and similarly for the period two I will be paying 6% in the from market receive my bar for the period three I will be paying 6.10% and for period four I will be paying 6.20% so this is the from market uh, interest cost for me if you come to this IRS market since the interest rate is fixed at six percent i buy this uh, uh, irs contract where actually i am paying six percent i am receiving my bar so finally the, my net effective cost if i go into the from market transaction my net effective cost is 5.90 percent plus one percent that is 6.90 percent on the other hand in the irs market my interest cost is six percent plus one percent seven percent so similarly for other periods if you look at 7% uh, in fraud, 7% in IRS for period 3, 7.10% in fraud, 7%. I, if you look at, at the end of the period, my interest cost would be 7.05% for, uh, for fraud market transaction and for 7% in the IRS market. So my interest cost is known and fixed actually in the IRS market, which is less than the fraud market cost by five basis points. So it makes sense actually for me to go in for IRS contract. So the CFO decides, the CFO decides actually to enter into a IRS contract. So this is how I can make use of you no. Know, if unfortunately the from market is not active, if from market is active, you can make use of this you no know, both the markets to compare what sort of cost actually prevailing in these two markets, and accordingly you can uh, do your hedging transaction. Is it clear? So if there are no queries, uh, then I can move to the next slide. I just see this uh, uh, global uh, OTC derivatives market, a brief uh, picture of global OTC derivatives. The global OTC derivatives market 
<clears throat> these are all uh, expressed in uh, billions of usd so that means actually foreign exchange contracts are the dominating uh, contracts in the derivative space <clears throat> in the 558 uh, trillion dollars whereas uh, next comes uh, interested contracts with the 448 uh, trillion dollars and uh, the biggest problem created in 2008 that is the credit derivative contracts form only a small percentage in this global OTC derivatives which is again less than one percent so in the global OTC derivatives that it is dominated by the foreign exchange contracts followed by these interstate contracts <clears throat> on the exchange traded derivatives again uh, the interstate derivative contracts dominate uh, the space whereas the foreign exchange contracts uh, is having around uh, less than two percent of the market share <clears throat> even actually the interested derivative contracts, the future interested futures contracts are more than these interested option contracts and major what is it derivative reforms uh, this is what uh, g20 so uh, subsequent to this uh, 2008 crisis G20 came out with uh, their recommendations because the subprime crisis happened uh, or, uh, no, arose on account of these uh, OTC derivatives, especially the credit, uh, credit derivatives. So uh, their recommendations were all standardized. Uh, the, all OTC derivative contracts should be standardized as far as possible, and they should be traded on electronic platforms. And as far as possible, they should be settled through central counterparties. And all what is a derivative contract should be reported to trade repositories so that uh, the global regulators will have direct access to this trade repository trade, trade repositories and they have uh, they can assess actually what sort of uh, risk is building up what kind of notional position how much exposure the entities have in this uh, what is a derivative space so all those uh, uh, assessments uh, can be done by these global regulators through the trade repositories and uh, wherever the contracts which are not centrally uh, cleared through central counterparties, parties they should be subject to higher marginal requirements so this uh, the first four uh, have already been implemented uh, uh, globally even in india we have introduced um, uh, rbi has introduced uh, uh, standardized what is it derivative contracts to a certain extent and uh, all the standardized contracts, especially the IRS contracts and forest forward contracts are mandatorily settled through Clearing Corporation of India Limited. And uh, the RBI has uh, advised the Clearing Corporation of India Limited to establish a trade repository for uh, all reporting of what is derivative contracts. And uh, non-centrally clear contracts, the bilateral marginal requirement for non-centrally clear contracts that is yet to be uh, operational. So the, but consultation paper was released by RBI uh, in the year 2016. And globally also this uh, bilateral margining is to be implemented for the non uh, centrally clear contracts so these are all the some major uh, otc derivative reforms undertaken globally and also the extent of compliance uh, uh, by reserve bank of india to g20 reforms yeah that's all about uh, my otc derivative interest rate uh, market if there are any queries, I'm uh, glad to take those queries. I can see some uh, on the chat box. Sorry, I missed the chat box. Uh, one, Mr. Uh, one, uh, what do you mean by two different benchmark rates? So when I say two benchmark rates, we have already talked about the MyBar benchmark rate, right? Overnight MyBar benchmark rate is. Then I can always look at another benchmark rate which can be linked to T bill rate, a 364-day T bill or 90-day T bill rate. So if I am exposed to my assets are repriced, my assets are linked to uh, the T bill rates and my liabilities are linked to MyBar benchmark rate, then these are two different my assets and liabilities are exposed to two different benchmarks, two different floating rates and they may not move in tandem with each other so i will be exposed to the basis risk actually in these two benchmarks then what is fimda fimda is a self regulatory body it was formed at the instigation of reserve bank of india it is the body of the market market participants fimda is fixed income money markets 
and derivatives association so they said actually the uh, market conventions uh, for various uh, uh, transactions happening in the money market space and also in the government securities uh, trading so they are always closely associated with the Reserve Bank of India and they closely associated with the market players and also with the Clearing Corporation of India Limited for smooth conduct of activities in the government securities and money market space. For housing loans borrowing, which is beneficial fixed rate or floating rate? It all depends again. No, what sort of view you have uh, on the interest rate front, right? If interest rate is going to come down, then ideally you should go for floating rate. If interest rate is going to go up, then you should go in for fixed rate. You have to fix your uh, cost of interest. So, so here you borrowed my borrow rate, and that 0.20% is what you have to pay for borrowed money for six months. That leads no profit and no loss. ஒன்பதுக்கும் <laughs> 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 In this example, actually, we have taken the MIBOR rate, actually, interbank in the market, MIBOR market, I am borrowing, and in the swap market, I am paying MIBOR. So, these two costs is nullified now. So, nothing is, it's finally, a net effect is zero. Whereas, on the other side, I am making a spread of 0.20% between my investment in the CD market, which was offering around 3.75%, and the interest, fixed interest cost, I am going, I am paying in the swap market at the rate of 3.55%. So this is the 0 0.20 spread which I, which I was talking about. So here clearly I will be making a 20 basis points profit in this uh, arbitrage transaction. Uh, suggest uh, the book or website to study India trend on my form. So this always you can uh, visit uh, CCL website cclindia.com. So this is the site. So this is the site you can look at you know, for uh, uh, IRS transactions, whether it is on uh, MyBar benchmark or MyFor benchmark. So you'll get all those details uh, on a daily basis. And you can also look at the publications of uh, CCIL, that is mainly the Rakshitra. It is a monthly publication, where actually you'll get actually the transactions uh, that have been concluded in various markets, like government securities market, your money market space, interest rate derivatives, and uh, the Forex market. You all you you can get all those details in this Rakshitra monthly bulletin from the CCL website. You can download that uh, magazine on a monthly basis. Uh, 